Now, just recently, it was announced that one of the oldest newspapers in Latin America, the Buenos Aires Herald, is to close down. The Herald was run by the English-speaking community in Argentina and is credited with standing up to the bloody military dictatorship which ruled in the 1970s and early 1980s. Robert Cox, who edited the paper throughout the country's most difficult time, has been speaking to Simon Watts. In March 1976, the armed forces seized power in Argentina. The generals pledged to restore order after years of violence by left-wing guerrilla groups and shadowy right-wing death squads. Military came in, and that wasn't unusual. Fifty years in Argentina, the military had dominated the country, coup after coup after coup. This is Robert Cox, editor of the Buenos Aires Herald in 1976. Generally speaking, there was a sigh of relief throughout the country because they thought it would be the end of tremendous violence. But we saw signs from the very beginning that things were not going to be the way the military were presenting it. In fact, the Argentine military had a plan to systematically eliminate all traces of what they regarded as potential subversion, targeting students, journalists and left-wing priests in particular. Within days of the coup, Robert Cox and his small team began hearing about mass disappearances. There were particularly appalling stories from the small city of Zarate. A man of about 40 who went back to university, one o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on, on the door of the house. His wife told me we looked through the panes of the glass and we saw a silhouette of either police or military, so we opened it. They just said we need to take him off for a few questions. Two days later, his body was found in a ditch. Robert wrote a report about the crackdown in Zarate for the Washington Post. And he was also hearing about the scale of the repression in Buenos Aires itself. One of the friends that I had at that time was a a marvellous woman who was looking for her husband who had been taken away. She said, you know, they're burning bodies in the crematorium. And so we went, we drove one night to the crematorium, which is in the centre of Buenos Aires, and there it was, incredible sight, the smoke and everything else, pouring out of the chimney of the crematorium. That confirmed to me that what the dictatorship was involved in was a form of genocide. That was the kind of situation that existed in Argentina that nobody knew about because there was a wish in Argentina not to see things. People decided they didn't want to know what was happening. My job then was to get the news out in a country that had been silenced. Throughout the dictatorship, Robert Cox continued to publish uncensored reports in the foreign press. But the Buenos Aires Herald had to be more careful and coded in its coverage. Many Argentine journalists who tried to write about the missing paid with their lives. With its English-speaking readership and American owners, the Herald was in a privileged position. Robert Cox and his small team managed to publish editorials urging an end to the disappearances, and that attracted the attention of the many Argentines desperate for help. People used to come to the Herald to denounce the disappearance of a daughter, son, husband, whole family. They were lined outside like waiting in a doctor's waiting room. The Herald would interview each person in the line, check the facts, and then publish a short article, saying simply that they were looking for a relative. I tried to use the newspaper to save lives. That was essentially what I was doing. We would take cases because we were trying to shame the military into behaving with decency. In some cases, we managed to get it. For example, we discovered that if a whole family had been taken including the children. If we could get hold of the photographs of the children and publish them on the front page, the children would appear. Robert Cox received death threats almost every day, and then, finally, he was arrested. The first place they put me was in this horrible cell called a tubo. You don't see anything when you go inside. It's as if you're stuck in a very narrow chimney, and gradually eyes get used to things. And then I started to look at the inscriptions, and the walls were covered with inscriptions, and only one political inscription. The others were appeals to their mother. To, I mean, it was horrifying to read. It was so heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. Then they moved me to a somewhat better cell, and they got me out quickly. I'd become a problem for them by that time. I was talking to all the diplomats, and the, the democratic countries did their utmost to help. Why did they not just close the paper down? 
they would quote the Herald as being an example of the fact that they <laughs> they did, they allowed press freedom. That I think, and not quite knowing who I was, the the Navy commander thought that I was a CIA agent. So that might have been another reason. You have British British citizenship as I well. I had British, and they also gave me an OBE at that time. I don't believe journalists should accept those things. Uh, it was a kind of principle of mine. But in this case, it was such an act of decency. I mean, I think that helped save my life because, you know, I was, uh, I was somebody. But even after he was released, the threats against Robert Cox continued. In 1979, he decided to leave Argentina when his young family were targeted. My 11-year-old son got a sinister letter they managed to do it on school stationery, which they'd taken. And so he read it. He opened it up, and then he read the first lines were, Dear little Peter, we are not accustomed to eating little children for breakfast. When that was followed up by an attempt to kidnap my wife as she crossed the road from our apartment, I decided that I, for the sake of the children, I had to leave. You did stay, though, for, for a long time, for more than three years, taking... You know, obvious risks to to do this. Yeah, and kind I intended of reporting. to come back. I, I I decided early on. I know it sounds crazy, but I said to myself, "They're going to kill me," and um, every day that they didn't was fine. It was a bit like fear of flying. I think I was frightened of flying the first time, but the second time was better. Third time, eventually, you get used to it. By the time the dictatorship ended in 1983, tens of thousands of people had disappeared. In recent years, Robert Cox has heard from more and more Argentines who say they were saved by his articles. One man told Robert how the Herald helped him survive at one of the most famous torture centres, known as the ESMA. What he told me was this. He said, one day they came and they kicked me harder than usual. I was thrown on the floor and sort of I looked up and the man screamed at me, what's this? And he saw a clipping from a newspaper and he said, but I don't speak English, what is it? What have you done? How did you do this? What it was was that his mother came to see me. And I, it was one of the things that it struck me. Well, I, I'll just tell a simple story of a mother looking for her son. And fortunately, it had the effect on the military of deciding that they were not going to kill him. So they allowed him to stay and they gave him a job mending typewriters. And with the demise of the Herald, I'm getting all kinds of messages from people all over the place saying thanks to the Herald. We still have our children that were saved and things like that. So one realizes how important journalism is and how terrible the situation is when there is no journalism, when people are not being informed of what's happening. Robert Cox, former editor of the Buenos Aires Herald, was speaking to Simon Watts.